Hi everyone, um, welcome to our last pre-lunch session. Um, and today we've got a panel uh, called Coding Confessions, and uh, the panel chair is uh, Colin Soze. And he, go go ahead, Colin. Thank you. Um, I just want to give a bit of a background to how we came about um, with this idea. Um, this started out as a hack day idea at the collaborations workshop run by the Software Sustainability Institute in 2021. Um, between myself, Irene, who's here, um, Dave, and Patricia Hetrick, who unfortunately can't be here today. And we kind of had two motivations for this. One was that we wanted to get people to sort of admit to their coding failures and why their code had failed, so that we kind of normalize that culture and help people's mental health that, you know, you tackle imposter syndrome, that we all make mistakes of coding. It's not something that, you know, senior super rock star developers don't do. We all do it and getting maybe more junior members of our teams to understand that is really key. And actually, I think that point was raised as a question in the last talk about how do you um, tell junior developers that they are going to make mistakes? Well, admitting to some of your own is a great way to do that. And the other aspect of this is from a more sort of software engineering point of view that if we tell people about our mistakes, then hopefully they won't repeat them, and that we can kind of build up a, a sort of database of common coding mistakes and get people to know about those, and we won't go and repeat those. And so the idea we have is that each panelist will get five minutes to tell us about one mistake they have made in their coding career and how we can also avoid repeating that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the panel. So if you could each introduce yourselves and then we will go on to your confessions. Just the introduction right now? Yes, just yeah, the yeah, introduction. Okay. Yeah, my name is Annika, hello. Uh, for those who haven't met me, I'm a senior RC at UCL. Um, uh, hi, my name is Callum. Um, I'm a research data scientist at the Turin. Hi, I'm Mark Woodbridge. I'm a software developer working at the UK Dementia Research Institute. Hi, I'm Sadie Bartholomew. I'm a computational scientist working at the University of Reading and the National Centre for Atmospheric Science. Hi, I'm Dan Katz. I'm the chief scientist at the National Centre for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois. Hello, my name is Linus. I'm working at the EPFL in Switzerland, also as a lead uh, software researcher, software engineer. All right, so thank you for that. So if we now start with the confessions with Anika, and we'll work our way down the panel. So you each get five minutes to tell us about one coding mistake you've made. OK, so I thought I have multiple confessions. So my first one is that I'm feeling really self-conscious right now. Um, <laughs> The thing is that, you know, when people invite me to um, come and do these things, my first initial, uh, initial reaction is always say yes, and then uh, afterwards think, oh God, what have I done? Um, but anyway, I wanted to give a sh big shout out to the organizers, because I think it's really important to do that work. And with that in mind, I'm now confessing to my coding sin. Um, in a past career, or well, not in a past career, in one of my career steps, I was a software engineer and um, I was looking after web applications. Now, back in the days, that was before cloud computing. And the way it worked is that as a software developer, you were writing your web app, then you would hand it over to a different team they would do uh, a little bit of testing and then it would go live. And if you were lucky, you were then to do some statistics, but it was mainly with the web developer at the time to do the statistics. Now, I wrote my app. Um, that was one to analyze lots and lots of models and provide the results back to the end user. Now, I did my due diligence, um, I did a few tests, and I'm not sure how you feel about debugging, but sometimes I do that by just doing printouts. Now, I like printouts, um, and in some cases, debuggers are also not giving you the full scope. So I started writing my app, and I wrote two log files. Now that was all good and well, um, and I assured myself that everything was working. Then I handed over the app, and then things went into production. And a few weeks later, I get a call, and basically somebody's telling me that my app has torn down the server. And I mean, what do you do? You know, first, uh, first stage of grief, 
denial. <laughs> now, that couldn't have been me, possibly. <laughs> By now you probably know what I've done, right? No? Yeah? So I had all my model output, whenever I did a con uh, calculation, I wrote it to the log file. Now that meant the log file exploded, the server exploded, and I tore everything down. I guess what I learned from that is, why well, I still do like debugging into uh, output files, but probably switch it off once you are done. <laughs> Try to get some sort of means that actually forces you to switch it off. Get somebody else to stress test the application before you send it to the production team, but also try to encourage the production team to do their due diligence. So I would like to think there was a little bit, like a small, tiny little bit of a error on, on another part. But yeah, I mean, other than that, uh, keep on coding and do your mistakes. I think they're important. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thanks, that's great. <laughs> um, so I'm a relatively n um, new kind of software engineer in like two years in the um, role. And so before that, like uh, many of us that do the role, I was, I was a researcher, so I was a PhD student and a postdoc in experimental psychology, not um, a physicist like everybody else. Um, <laughs> And um, the uh, the classic fear of uh, of many researchers is that you spend um, so long crafting this like beautiful experiment. You spend a lot of time um, then collecting the data. You do the fun part, which is analysing it. Then you might give some talks. You might write write the paper, and then you uh, find that there's a bug in the results. Um, somehow, and then it all comes uh, crashing down. Um, so, I, I actually have a few confessions where this happened to me, but I think the uh, silliest um, one was at the start of my postdoc. So, by now, I was meant to have been a fully trained, good scientist from, from your PhD. Um, and we had started this big collaboration. Um, and designed, I think, what was quite a quite a beautiful experiment, and and then spent a lot of time collecting the data. Um, and when I came round to analysing the results, I realised I'd done the kind of cardinal sin of 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 what a research, researcher should not do, and that is um, saved over the data um, completely. So um, in if anyone's familiar with um, a lot of uh, 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 psychology experiments, you do lots of um, uh, trials for each, for each condition because um, humans are annoying and they're variable, so you need to sample them for um, quite, quite a lot. Um, so what I'd done is quite simply, I had not included the trial uh, number in the file name. Um, so I just had one, uh, one trial per condition, which was about like 10% or so of the data that, um, that I needed. So um, um, this was something I obviously couldn't keep quiet. <laughs> so it was something like I was like very embarrassed to own up to because it's, like, uh, it's, it's like one of the first things you uh, uh, try and not do when you, when you get into uh, uh, research. Um, but yeah, I had to own up to it. Um, Everyone, after an initial annoyance, everyone was quite uh, found it quite funny, and then it ended up being uh, being a constant joke that people were sent to during during the course of the postdoc. Um, so I, I guess because I know we're meant to um, finish with like a, a like okay, how to how, how to uh, stop that um, for which I which I guess is just like write write good tests and get someone to review your code. Um, and I'd love to say that I've um, learned from that, and now I write beautiful tests all the time. But um, <laughs> anyone who has worked with me know that that's not true. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that's my, my code in sin. Thank you. Hi. So yeah, I've been coding long enough to have made far too many mistakes that I can mention 
here. Uh, I'll mention one which is not as consequential as the, as the rest, perhaps, but it was very recent, so I, I remember it, but um, not well enough not to need some, some notes. But we, I, I work on this Minder platform, which is a healthcare platform, and for the purpose of this discussion, it's kind of a smart home project. So just to, to hook up people to the platform, we need like a single-use email address. We're getting rid of this requirement. But um, this gets really difficult to manage. So we recently changed email, these email addresses so they included a plus character, right? Because in Gmail, it turns out you can have lots of email addresses in a single account just by appending plus whatever to the end. So this is all fine. Um, but the first mistake was doing this without thinking through whether it would have any consequences for the existing platform. And it does, as it turns out, because plus is a special character. And if you, if you send an, a, a, a query with a plus, that represents a space character, a character encoding in a, in a request. So we didn't think about that. And it broke search in the app. So you could no longer search for people. And this is the primary means by which our monitoring team used the app. They first log in, look for somebody, see if there's any outstanding issues, resolve them. So um, it noticed, we noticed this wasn't possible to search for these people now we'd uh, used these updated email addresses. That's fine. So first mistake was not considering what might happen if we do that. Um, then again, I, I guess the second issue was if you know a bit about you know, HTTP and uh, this kind of request, you think you know the solution, right? It's just encode the character. So there's an element of overconfidence in thinking you know the answer. You assume that the previous developers didn't consider this. So that's another assumption that turned out to be uh, at least partially incorrect. Um, I assume that such a simple fix wouldn't have broader consequences. We just encode the character and move on. And I think subconsciously, I, I kind of relied on the fact that we do have quite a robust QA process involving manual and automated testing. Anyway, so I made the change, and um, it completely broke lots of other parts of the app. It fixed the search, <laughs> but, but it meant that you could no longer do other important things like paginate between search results and do group management and lots, lots of other things. Um, yeah, so that was an issue. Um, it didn't quite make it to production, but it almost, it almost did. So yeah, it wasn't so bad. But I think we learned a lot from such a seemingly innocuous kind of bug that, um, yeah, we, we only have a limited test set in our testing environment. So actually, you didn't need to paginate between results. Um, I think, you know, I wrote a compelling description in the merge request of what the issue was, how to, how to test the fix. And that was slavishly followed by some of my colleagues, just simply because they assumed that I understood the issue, that I was more familiar with the code base than them, perhaps more experienced than them in terms of years spent coding. So they tested it without skepticism, um, which you know I don't blame anybody for, but, but myself ultimately. But it turned out we had no automated end-to-end -end tests for these other features. Um, and we didn't do cleverer things either, like we don't have we use TypeScript, and we could actually use types to distinguish between sanitized and non-sanitized um, variables or, or inputs, and we don't do that. So yeah, and, and kind of finally, the QA, which is done by the designer, uh, didn't follow, uh, didn't run his full regression suite manually because it's time consuming. And again, I provided my own kind of test script, which seemed fairly compelling. So uh, yeah, lessons learned is that you yeah, have a process in place that you follow based on a, on a checklist that we do now. We're, we're gradually rolling out further automated tests. And um, yeah, and just having that more healthy skepticism, I, I guess, you know, don't take anything for granted and um, keep an open mind about the cause of issues, the consequences of fixes. And um, one final thing to mention is this kind of broken window stuff. Don't leave stuff broken or, or unchallenged or un, unfixed because Actually, we dismissed this concern because we thought pagination wasn't working at first because of a race condition that we were trying to fix in another issue. So we said, this isn't really broken by this. It turned out that it was. We didn't investigate. So in the end, everything was, was fine. But we've changed a lot of things in response to a simple bug. That's it. Um. 
Hi, so I'm Sadie, and I have a, con a coding confession to make. Um, um, hello. <laughs> um, so let me first provide some background. Um, so I've been an effective RSC for about five years now, um, and the confession in question relates to my previous job at the UK Met Office, uh, where I was predominantly developing and maintaining um, open source Python code um, towards a few particular libraries as part of a wider team of about five people. Um, so the code bases in question were hosted on GitHub and we followed a pretty standard um, Git development workflow which involved use of um, issues on the issue trackers and pull requests which were peer reviewed by uh, at least one other member of the team. Um, now the time in question that I'd like to share, um, I was working on a bug fix um, for a bug in, in one particular code base um, that was causing some faulty behavior in the system. I'd employed various debugging techniques and reached a stage where I suspected um, I knew what would fix the bug. So I was um, in the process of changing the logic um, in the code base on a branch um, in the relevant part of the code and seeing what that did. And notably, I'd managed to update the, the logic to an extent that the um, faulty behavior was partially fixed but there was still something that wasn't playing ball um, to make it fully correct. And I kept, I kept going to try and make it fully correct, but I just wasn't having any luck. Um, and I was, on the progress of, I was in the process of getting, starting to get frustrated, which to me is a kind of a red flag because I, I know it makes me think kind of illogically and um, that's not what you need when you're, you're debugging. Um, so eventually I decided I'd move on to a different task I thought I'll part this for later, I'll come back afresh um, to continue on the bug fix and hopefully have a eureka moment at that point. Um, so I committed what I'd, I'd changed to get um, kind of a partial fix in the behavior um, on my local branch and I moved on. Um, so I started on this new item of work, um, which was some other development on the same code base. Um, and actually I immediately noticed another bug in the system relating to a similar part which on the face of it, um, it wasn't as improbable as it might seem because um, from experience I know that bugs can be concentrated in um, parts of the code that are, are more complex, say, or weak, or just in particular areas. So I went in and found a fix for that pretty quickly. Um, and I actually put up a, a pull request uh, on GitHub against the, the main branch, raising, um, Instead of raising an issue first, I actually described the bug on the pull request because I thought this is, you know, it's quite trivial, the fix is quite trivial. Um, it's best to just describe it because I already had the fix. Um, and on reviewing, a senior colleague immediately um, raised that he couldn't recreate the bug um, in question, no matter what he tried. And it turned out in the end, after a little bit of, invest of investigation and some confusion, um, I realized that the bug that I'd raised for the, the pull request um, wasn't in the main code base at all, um, hence why my colleague couldn't recreate it. Um, embarrassingly, it was actually that I'd neglected to change my GitHub branch. So I was actually noticing a bug in the system that I'd basically created by changing the code in the previous task um, on that, that previous commit. Um, so I guess to summarize the crux of the, the, um, the confession, I'd managed to successfully fix a bug but it was one that um, didn't actually exist because I <laughs> introduced it myself um, to the code base locally um, and just being a bit careless about, I guess, um, keeping track of my Git branch and um, what I was working on. Um, so my, my immediate reflection is um, both in research and software engineering and certainly RSC work where we'll be combining facets of both um, in some respect. Uh, a core part of our jobs is problem solving. And I think a lot of us find that really enjoyable um, to, well, either really enjoyable or partly enjoyable. Um, but it's important to ensure you're solving the right problem. Um, it's totally useless to, to solve a wrong problem, no matter how satisfying that may be. Um, and yeah, in this case, obviously it was, it was being in the right branch, but I think it extends to and try to ensure that you've got the correct setup and environment there. So whether that's um, the library, the direct library you're working on, um, any dependencies or any other factors that, that may have influence. Um, and drilling down a bit into how I went wrong, I guess, after I'd, I'd contemplated on this, um, I think it centers on the concept of, of context switching. Um, so we all have numerous tasks to do at any one time. Um, 
and there's always going to be a changeover point. Oh, sorry, um, I'll be quick. Um, so yeah, just just be careful when you're context switching to um, to kind of recenter yourself on the new problem. Um, and if you can, make notes on where you are if you are doing what I had, which was the bug um, before that I decided to, to park for a bit and move on to something different. Um, I think that's most of what, what I wanted to say. Sorry, I've gone slightly over time. Thanks. Okay, so um, so my story is uh, has a couple of different confessions in it. Um, this was uh, 1997 and 1998 when I'd started working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California for NASA. Uh, and I was working on a project with a distributed team of scientists where I was trying to work on their code. Um, they were in New Mexico and, and Baltimore and, and somewhere else, and there were about 12 of them that were all working together on this code that um, where they had to meet performance milestones in order to get paid uh, for their next increment of time to continue working on the project. And, and so my job was to help them meet their performance milestone. Um, and it's the, the thing that was really nice was the, the beginning of this was the fact that everybody was in a different place and we didn't, I didn't know any of them. Um, so I was offered the opportunity to fly to San Francisco to have lunch with them, um, which was kind of nice, actually. Uh, because they were all going to be at the AGU conference, and that was the only time that everybody was in the same place except me. So, uh, so it was a nice start, um, and it was a friendly group, and they they all worked together really really well, and, and seemed to be a good team. Um, so I started looking at their code, and um, and I found some problems where I thought there was some really inefficient work that I could improve, and I could make it much more efficient. And I spent I don't know, maybe two or three weeks working on uh, a bit of code and, and realized that I had improved it quite a lot uh, and ran the code again with the test case and, and found out that it worked. Um, but it actually didn't make any difference in terms of the overall execution time because uh, I'd spent a lot of time working on a, a piece of code that actually didn't really get used very much uh, <laughs> and didn't realize that you should actually first try to figure out what's the time consuming part before you start doing the optimization. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Uh, the, other, the other part of this that happened then after that was I, I kind of learned from that mistake and continued onward um, and found things that actually were important and realized that they were not going to be simple to fix and that fixing them was going to involve restructuring large parts of the code. Um, compilers were not great at that point, so I had to do some kind of manual loop unrolling. I had to do a, a bunch of stuff that really made the code, I would say, very, uh, very ugly and very hard to read. Um, but it did actually get to the performance milestone, and so I, I gave it to them, and they turned it in, and they met their milestone, and they got paid, and they were able to continue the project, which was great. Um, and then when we were getting towards the next milestone, um, where they had to actually improve the code to, to add some new features as well as to meet a different performance milestone. Um, they, again, were looking for help on that. And so they gave me the code that they had added um, this new physics to uh, and asked if I could help them with it. And I looked at it and I realized that they had started with the version of the code that was the same version that they had had before I had made my changes. Um, the, the changes that I made actually weren't in their, their code. And I asked them about that, and it turned out the reason was that the changes I made had changed their code into my code. Uh, and it was no longer their code. They didn't understand it. They didn't feel like they could own it any longer. Um, and so they just used it for that performance milestone, and then, then they, they gave up, and they went back to their old code. Uh, so, the, so the confession here is uh, it's bad to take somebody else's code and to not work with them fairly closely as you're making changes, um, which I really didn't understand at all at that point, but, uh, but quickly learned that, right, that, that you need to be, um, well, as an RSE, uh, which was called a computational scientist at that point, um, that you needed to be much more collaborative and, and working in terms of kind of doing work for somebody as a service was not a good way to, to be successful in the long run. So thank you. So yeah, uh, I'm very glad to be here with the Codaholics Anonymous. Um, so you know how it goes, I say, hello, my name is Linus, and you say? Yes. So I have a confession to make. Um, I programmed for 39 years without taking into account variable ownership. So what is variable ownership? How did I program for 39 years? So this is a typical, so it's not all I did during 39 years. I did more than that. Huh? So. 
a very simple program. You initialize a variable, you give it to a first method, you give it to a second method. Now, this goes well as long as both methods don't do anything fancy. Now, for those who know the Go language, in Go language you always do these Go routines, you know, where you think, put something in a thread. Now, if all of a sudden init systems uh, uses a Go routine where this config variable goes in and the start listener's method also does the same thing, well, you have contention, you have a race condition. Now, all of a sudden, two pieces of the code want to access the same variable and you have a problem, you have a race condition. So, um, variables owned by multiple processes are prone to race conditions. So, uh, we, we, we most of the time know that. So, 39 years, so what I did is I write some code, something fails, or in Go, there's this Go test as as race, which is uh, useful. You add a mutex and you try again. But then, of course, uh, you have things that make this go worse. Um, in Go, sometimes you can copy structures, but it's quite complicated. And most of the languages also don't, don't handle copying structures well. This, it works if you have simple variables in them, simple fields. But if you have slices, pointers, interfaces, all of a sudden, the copy of your structure is, in fact, not a copy. So part of it is still handled twice in the same way, and, and it's a mess. Then, of course, you have YOLO, you only live once programming, so you just do this for once and it will never be touched again. And then it's in the very center of a program which fails. Uh, and you have JavaScript, which is a problem of its own. <laughs> <clears throat> so what happens is that I, I like learning new programming languages because each new programming language teaches you new things, you know. You learn C, so you see that everything that can go wrong will go wrong, uh, that is C. Uh, then you can learn something like Go, which uh, you can be the new kid, a cool kid on the block and still not program very nicely like I did. You can learn JavaScript, which uh, I, I don't know. So, sorry for the JavaScript puns. Um, I, I discovered ownership thanks to Rust. I'm really a, a Rust fan now. And in fact, if I take the same program as before, so initializing a variable, giving it to two methods, Rust in fact complains and tells me straight away, no, you cannot do this here because you're putting this variable to two different methods and I will not allow that. Because it's like if you, if you give ownership to this variable twice to two different people, you cannot do that. So you need to be a bit more smart about it and you can do things like uh, borrowing. And here also Rust is very nice. So if you borrow a variable, if you say, okay, I, I give it to this method and you can use it, but you need to give it back. And then Rust is, is, is very, looks very nicely that there is nothing copied. So there is no slice that is still kept in the method. There is no interface or other pointer that is still kept in the method. It really makes sure that the method returns the entirety of the variable and that it does not keep anything before you give it to the next method. Um, you can also do mutexes. Uh, mutexes in Go, they are kind of, they work. But you can forget to, to, to lock the mutex, which is, yeah, happened all the time. And then with Rust, it's very nice because you don't put the mutex in the structure, you put the structure in the mutex. So if you want to use the structure, you actually have to take the mutex before you're even allowed to use the structure. It's, it's really very nice. It's really very nice. And so like that, um, I start now seeing uh, ownership problems a bit everywhere I go. So if I have to go back to Go, to JavaScript, to C, it's sometimes hell because I'm like, oh no, this will never work. So every variable needs to be owned by only one process. For shared variables, I will always use a mutex, I swear. I will not complain that my code gets more complex. It is for my own good. And I hope that in 39 more years, I will have a new coding confession. Thank you. Hello everyone. So my confession is about when I tried learning a new programming language. Uh, so for a large part, uh, I was uh, working in a language which has really good documentation. So I could uh, really rely on the documentation and uh, however difficult the problem be, uh, I was always confident that uh, I'm going to solve it. So uh, because I know this language and I know, I know the excellent documentation that it, it has. So uh, when uh, I switched, like I was expected to switch uh, to a different language for one project, 
so I said, no problem. I can code in one language. I can pick up the other one really easily. So I started reading uh, the books, and I'll say, oh, I'm going to do this. I can learn this language. So I, read, I started reading a book. I almost completed it, and I was thinking, oh, I can I can code in this language now because I've read this book, and I start coding. But no matter what I do, uh, I always uh, tend to search in the language that I was doing earlier. So I always searched what is the alternative to do in that language, and somehow I, it took me like really long to uh, you know work on a different language that time, and then uh, I and I was really hard on myself, uh, criticizing that. Oh, it, is this an issue with me? I cannot pick up a different language. Or what is happening? Why am I, why am I going back to the older ways of working? So, uh, and I like I do. I spent an entire night uh, to just figure out how to code in a new language. And the next morning, I was feeling happy that oh, uh, now I am successful and uh, you know successfully coded in a different language. But uh, I don't think that is a good practice. Uh, I think learning should be taken slowly, and uh, you need to be more kind to yourself uh, as you learn, and not self-criticize, which we tend to do a lot when we are not able to. Because when you code and you don't see an output coming, it it makes me really anxious. Oh, this is the expected. What is happening? Oh, what is the issue? Or uh, why is someone not just coming and telling me why this error is occurring? Just tell me why it is occurring, and I'll resolve it, or something like that. It it uh, tends to get really. Um, it it's a really anxious feeling when that happens. So. Uh, uh, what I have learned is to be kind on myself and look out for help, and it's okay that uh, it is taking me time to learn something new, a uh, different language. Yeah. That's me. Right. Thank you to all the panelists. Saraji, I'm just really um, wondering what was the language? Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, I'm a statistician. I have been working in R, and this was the first time that I was trying to switch to Python, to do a project in Python. <laughs> and uh, I love the documentation in R, and somehow uh, I didn't. Uh, I'm not criticizing Python, but I didn't <laughs> like the uh, like it there. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you. They don't have a ray below their ships. But just before we take questions, I just want to point out that we also have a, a website where we write up these confessions, um, which is coding-confessions.github.io. And we also have the option on there to have you submit your own confessions, which we will publish anonymously, if you wish, on the website um, to kind of try and build up a sort of evidence bank almost of these common coding issues and to get you know, the wider community taking part in this event. This idea has now also been borrowed by the Code for Thought podcast, who have started a sort of sub-series called Coding Horror. They've had one episode out already by Yo Yehudi, who was one of our coding confessees last year at September RSE. I've actually done a recording which hasn't been published yet, and they will be looking for more people to do more episodes. So if you want to confess your coding mistakes in podcast format, then please get in touch with, um, I think it's Selena from the SSI, or I presume Peter can put you in contact with her. Um, I'd also like to thank the SSI actually for kind of sort of sponsoring this event and giving us the, um, code, the collaborations workshop that kind of spawned this idea. But now we can go over to any audience questions from Slido. <laughs> so I think obviously Python for life. Um, but we'll start with the first real question for um, Linus about, um, he mentioned Rust ownership issues. So what do you think is the balance between technical and social solutions in general? Between? Technical and social solutions. In? In general, so for any programming language, I presume that means. Balance between technical and social solutions. Ooh la la. Can you elaborate a bit more on what that question means? I don't know if the, the person who asked it wants to um, yeah. have the microphone and. Sorry. Let me microphone up to you. There you go, that one. Obviously not very 
I'm obviously not very articulate in text. Um, it was really that you were talking about, though, you finding that you were having ownership issues when you were creating your, you know, your Go code. Yep. And you found that Rust was able to provide you a hardline technical solution so you can't make that mistake anymore. But many of the other issues that have been talked about by people on the panel are things that they've, mistakes they've made due to uh, processes or collaborations or learning. Uh -huh. And I wonder how you see anyone on the panel, really, the balance between solving these problems with hardline technical, you can't possibly do it any other way, and collaboration and social solutions to these issues. OK, so yeah, from that point of view, um, I think you, you, you can solve some of these issues. I mean, there were some issues with, with Git, GitHub issues, and how you use, the, um, how you use your code. And this is something you can, you can make with a, with a well-defined workflow, okay, you need, to, you need to do X, Y, Z. But then you always need to take care because if you put too many constraints, then people will not want to work anymore because it, it just does not get manageable anymore. So I think there is a, there's a trade-off between putting all these constraints, which can also be in Rust sometimes very, very frustrating because Rust puts a lot of constraints in your code. And uh, a, a lot of things that you can just do it in, in JavaScript or in Go, Rust will just bark at you, bark at you and say, no way, it just does not work. But in the end, I, I think it, at least in the case of Rust, I think it's worth it. Uh, for some of the um, uh, more social constraints that we put also, like uh, how do you work with issues, with a pull request, you need to have a code review, you're not allowed to push uh, commit to the main branch. I think there are a lot of these more social constraints which make sense, but you always have to balance them so you don't, you don't go too much against the team. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, cool. Thank you. So the next one we got for Callum is you said that you were the source of constant jokes from your colleagues. Did that stick with you and how did it make you feel? Um, yeah, good question. Um, so I kind of had the privilege, I suppose, of working with some really nice uh, colleagues. Um, so, uh, so these jokes weren't malicious. Um, and it actually made me uh, uh, the kind of, because that was the first, well, maybe not the first experience of making mistakes, but the first experience of so publicly making a, a mistake. Um, so I suppose it gave me com uh, um, confidence to be vulnerable uh, with uh, mistakes because um, we just wrote it off as, as an expensive uh, pilot and we managed to like, learn from it and then we designed a better experiment um, next time. Um, and um, like, although people kind of like made fun of me, <laughs> it, was, it, it was always, um, well, I didn't feel like it was it was uh, malicious, but th there is um, so yeah. Everyone knows that in, that um, researchers and um, uh, often suffer from mental health issues, and there I there was uh, impact on on a perfectionism uh, uh, from this. Some obviously a little bit healthy because it's uh, uh, but clearly I could have done with a bit more perfectionism, um, but I definitely overcompensated it uh, for it for the rest of my postdoc. Um, um, so yeah, it had it it did have some uh, some knock on effects, I think. Okay, the next one. I'm not sure who this is necessarily aimed at, but my hovercraft is full of eels, which I think is a common example of a mistranslation. I think from something into Hungarian. Um, it says, we've all done it. It's hard to swap from one language such as R to another without end up speaking Python with an R accent. If anyone has a solution to alleviate this, I'd love to hear about it. So have any of the panelists got a solution for that? Okay, Exercise a lot. Yeah, practice in the new <laughs> <Practice>. language. <laughs> Make yourself write something in the new language. That's what I try and do. You can also read code, read existing code. And if you have somebody on the team who knows it, just go to that guy, gal, and just press it out of them and ask them, why do you do that? Why this? How does this work? OK, so the next one. Can any of the panel share examples of particularly supportive or unsupportive reactions to their mistakes? How can we create a supportive culture around these? Anybody want to take that one? Yeah, I can. 
Uh, is the mic on? Yeah, okay, now. Uh, so in terms of unsupportive reactions, um, I think in the past I had both unsupportive and supportive reactions and in the unsupportive one for me personally is when people don't tell me what I do wrong. So you know that you have done something, you kind of guess that something isn't working and then people don't tell you what you actually have done wrong. So for me feedback is something that's really important and um, in pair programming sessions just don't go quiet but <laughs> help the other one when you see that they're doing a mistake and don't let them just figure it out themselves a long time. I know it's not easy, it's not easy to tell someone that they are doing something wrong but at the end of the day we are learning from one another and somebody may, you know, uh, pay back the kindness to you at a later stage. Um, supportive behaviour that I think I have seen is when somebody actually takes the time and talks me through my mistakes. Um, some of my colleagues do that regularly because I, I do mistakes. Uh, I hope I learn from them. But it's just the taking the time, making sure that the other one has understood and then move on from it together. In some um, situations you might want to share that more widely, like going on a panel like this or I mean, in a small scale, you can share that in the group, just to avoid that somebody else does the same thing going forward. Yeah, does anyone else want to comment on that? I was going to say, I think for me that the time is really kind of the key piece, that if um, that people are generally supportive as long as they feel like they're able to be supportive, and if they're under time pressure, then they end up getting less supportive. And so if there's if there's time to fix the mistake, then I think you can almost frequently you can have good discussions about it and and talk about alternative ideas and, and what else you can do. But if there's less time, then it seems like the, the feedback is often less supportive, like this, or you didn't do this well, you need to fix it immediately, or or something like that. So. Uh, for me, uh, unsupportive are the unkind comments where, uh, which you get on your open source code. So if it's hosted somewhere on GitHub and say you're working on it still, uh, and if you know many people are interested in that work and something is breaking, so or if they have any complaints, so they just keep on posting their you know, complaints, complaints, complaints. So uh, uh, a supportive behavior instead would be to reach out to the developer uh, via their email and not you know keep on posting on their GitHub because it's public and uh, people devote, mostly the open source developers devote their free time. So it's, it's not regular, uh, regular checking those uh, comments. And uh, so uh, a better approach would be to, you know, uh, instead email or Slack them or use a different approach instead of a public comment over there. That, if I just may uh, comment, that's interesting because I heard some people saying they don't like being emailed or slacked uh, for, for, for two reasons. Uh, one is that it kind of breaks the, the um, um, it, it, it breaks the thing that they can take time if they want to, mm -hmm. whereas if you get an email or a slack, it's more, for them it's more offensive. I heard that as an argument from time to time. And the second argument they have is like, if it is as an issue, mm -hmm. um, Everybody can see it, which for some people is good because it means there can be a discussion. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you write an email, mm -hmm. well, the bug is hidden. And you don't know whether already somebody else emailed or whether somebody else already said, well, this thing does not work. Mm -hmm. So of course, if you just open 10 issues for the same bug, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> that is clear. But uh, that's just for uh, what I heard from some other people also. I see. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, issues are a good thing, but I was just mentioning about the unkind comments that people... Yeah, they should just be ignored, yes. They should just be ignored, yes. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and, and if you receive unkind emails, mm. well, just put them in the trash. Bin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got two minutes left, so I think we can probably get one more question out. So there's one here. I often worry that changing client code so much that my own personal imprint is overshadowing the original authors. Any tip for navigating issues like this? Dan, it sounds like the issue you were having. Um, sorry, I had difficulty hearing that one. Uh, well, 
Oh, yeah, uh, right. So I completely agree. I, I guess, yeah, the thing that I kind of learned from that was really just to work much more iteratively with the original authors and say, right, this is the this is the kind of change that I'm going to make. Does this seem like something that's reasonable? And, and then to actually try to get them to, to look at it after that change and make sure that they're still comfortable with it and do that in a much more fine-grained way than making lots of changes all at once and then trying to hand it off to them. Mm. Does anyone else have any comments on that one as well? Yeah. We, we were just working on a project where um, the code was really in a dire state. And then um, one of my engineers was working on that, and I told him to take it easy. And uh, he just started by doing small changes. And the more changes he did, the more the people saw that, in fact, he's very much knowledgeable than they are. And so in the end, they themselves asked him to help them to restructure the code which was then very nice because then, well, you go over the code and you restructure it because they ask you to, which is very nice. Okay, thank you to all the panel. Yeah, thanks very much for a really engaging session. I'm sure um, we, we can all relate to some of those things. Um, yeah, so please thank again the panel chair and all the panelists, please, thank you.